there is also Okay. All right, we are a little bit past 530, so I'll call tonight's joint workshop to order. And Karen, can we do a roll call, please? Council Member Husnick? Here. Council Member Valento? Here. Council Member Erickson? Here. Council Member Roberts? Here. Uh, EDA Member, sorry. <laughs> Larson. Uh, here. <laughs> EDA member um, Lorge. Here. EDA member Hoyt. Here. And EDA member no. Grindall. And Mayor Bain. Here. He survived. <laughs> I'd like to invite everyone to rise and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic. Under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So, just a note about format for tonight we are in a joint workshop of the EDA and City Council. Um, informal working session as a follow up to a meeting we had a couple of months ago now related to um, our policy on um, business subsidies. And um, just note of logistics, anything that we discussed tonight is a working session and intended to be open, um, open feedback and collaborative in nature. Anything we talk about that requires official action will come back before both EDA and council for official vote. So tonight is definitely on the informal nature. Um, we do have open forum scheduled as we do before all of our meetings. And Karen, do we have anyone scheduled for open forum or signed up? Not. No. All right, with that, we will kick us off. Abby, are you starting us? Sure am. Thanks, okay, Mayor Bain. Uh, members of the council, members of the EDA, I mean, Mayor, Mayor Bain, President Bain tonight. Um, at the EDA's regularly scheduled meeting in April, both bodies met to start discussions on a business subsidy policy. We brought in Ellers to help present to the council and the EDA um, some options for business subsidy development. Uh, tonight we have Jason with Ellers, uh, who's provided us with a, um, a proposed draft, which was included in your packet. And Jason's gonna walk through um, that proposed draft to get some feedback from the council and the EDA. From that, he will revise the plan and then it'll need to, or the policy, and then it'll come back to both bodies for formal consideration. We will have to hold a public hearing in the future and all of that will be subsequently scheduled after this meeting. So I'm gonna just hand it over to Jason and Jason, I'm not gonna to try to um, say your last name. Welcome. Great, thank you, uh, Mayor of the Council and EDA, Jason Arsvold uh, with Ellers. Uh, and as Abby said, I've got a, a few slides here to talk about the draft policy. You know, we got, uh, we got a good meeting back in in April and uh, talked about some of the things that might go into that policy, took a lot of that feedback uh, from you all and worked with the staff to put the draft together that's in front of you this evening. So just going to go back through a little bit about the why part about why we're doing this, just kind of reorient us here, talk about the structure and content of the policy. I'll go through the individual sections and Abby kind of covered next steps, but we'll just review those at the end. So again, why are we doing this? Well, one, uh, you know, the policy is required by state statute. And so uh, you need to have one of these if you're going to engage in providing assistance for any kind of development in the city. And so that's one of the, one of the primary reasons. Uh, this policy will talk about uh, the type of project that the city and EDA wants to assist. And so there are reasons beyond just, you know, the statutory requirements, you know, that you would choose to do this. Uh, and so in here is, is the draft that's in front of you has a lot more than just what's required by statute. It has a lot more about what the city wants to uh, finance and fund in terms of its priorities. So those things are listed in there. It's gonna uh, be a document that helps you communicate to your staff the kind of things that you wanna see happen if you're gonna provide public assistance. So it's gonna help them weed out all those projects that you may not want to assist and bring forward the ones that you do. 
Uh, and then I think finally, we did spend a fair amount of time actually talking about and building into this policy a, uh, an equitable process to review these applications. And you'll see that uh, expanded upon quite a bit and I'll talk about it at the end. So that I think is another big step that, ca that came out of this is that you'll have a prescribed process for dealing with these applications when they come in. So just very briefly, the structure and content, I'm not gonna go through you know, all the detail here, but there are this is laid out in different sections and each one you know, kind of has its own dif different uh, uh, purpose. Uh, section one just lays out the purpose and authority. Again, that just has to do with the statutory requirements of the policy. Uh, section two talks about your objectives for using public financing. So these are, not, uh, these are not project specific. These are just, hey, these are the things that we want to accomplish if we're going to use public tools to finance projects. Uh, and and same with section three, uh, really lays out those principles. These are kind of the best practices that you're bringing to the table when you're evaluating these requests for assistance. Section four starts to get into the project specific information. So these are the projects that qualify for assistance in your policy. So that's broken out into minimum qualifications and then desired qualifications. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, section five, there's a, a requirement in the statute that has you lay out you know, public purpose and job and wage requirements in your policy. Section five is doing that in your policy, meeting that statutory requirement. So you have a policy that complies with the business subsidy statute. Uh, related to that is section six. So when a project is uh, considered a business subsidy under the statute, then you have to have a business subsidy agreement. So section six just talks a little bit more about that. And then finally, section seven, that's that evaluation section that I, that I talked about previously. And we'll go into a little more detail about that as we, as we get into this. And please feel free to stop me if there are questions uh, as I go here. So again, section one, very kind of um, boilerplate, uh, has to do with the purpose and authority. Uh, you, you need to establish criteria for granting a business subsidy per the statute. That's what you're doing here. Uh, we indicate there that this is applying to both the city and the EDA. So it's, it's both bodies policies. You have multiple policies right now. This is really bringing all, all everything under one document for both bodies and all formats of assistance. So that's what this is doing. Uh, that just states that you're intending to comply with state statute. Uh, you know, we also, talked about the fact that this policy can and probably should apply to any kind of assistance, even if it's not technically a business subsidy under the statute. So the statute has a whole list of exceptions for things that aren't a business subsidy per the statute that you might give money for. Uh, a, a very simple basic one is housing. Any kind of project that you provide finance, any housing project that you provide financing for isn't a business subsidy under the statute, but you, know, you should probably still apply these same standards if you're gonna provide assistance to those projects. So that's what this is saying. And then again, the, the whole idea here is that we're trying not to be overly prescriptive with this policy. We wanna provide you with the flexibility when projects come along to be able to deviate and amend the policy or fit it within the context of the things that are laid out in the policy right now. So there's, that's really the overarching goal is to provide that flexibility. Questions about that? And then the objectives. So we talked a little bit about these back in April, uh, and some of you uh, wrote some of those out in a written form and kind of that homework that we talked about and gave. Uh, so these were those objectives that are listed in your policy. I don't necessarily need to read all of them, but basically, you know, removing blight, expanding the tax base, you know, uh, leveraging investment in infrastructure. That was that third one there, that bullet point. We talked a lot about that, uh, and you'll see that theme flow throughout the entire policy. So the idea that you're um, uh, desiring to support infrastructure development with your public financing uh, tools is is well represented, I think, in the policy. So just you'll see that as we go along. Uh, you know, talk about encouraging spin-off development, uh, offsetting redevelopment costs, developing sites that are difficult to develop because of financial challenges, uh, retain, increase, and diversify jobs, opportunities for small businesses, furthering their DEI goals, increasing housing choice broadly. Uh, and meeting any other city policies and some of them that are listed there include the uh, design standards that you may establish, uh, sustainability efforts as well, some of those things that we talked about, leaving in there in sort of a general way in the policy, you'll see those in there as well. Questions about that? Uh, section three uh, talks about the public financing principles. So again, these are those general best practices as you approach providing public assistance. Uh, so those sort of lay out some of the things that are, are good to do for all projects, not just business subsidies. So talking about reviewing each request to determine if assistance is necessary. So that's that but for test. Remember we talked about, you know, you're not gonna provide, you know, 
the, the project wouldn't happen but for uh, you providing that assistance and so you want to see if it meets that test. Uh, we, we did discuss this idea that that whole analysis and the outcome and, and um, results of that analysis would be summarized in a memorandum that would come before the city and EDA so you'd be able to understand how and why that, uh, that test was met. Uh, we talked about including checks and balances within your future agreements. So that includes things in the policy right now, like uh, like look back agreements, uh, you know, documenting qualified costs, those sorts of things are, are listed in there. Uh, trying to reduce your risk when using TIF or abatement. And there are a couple of ex uh, examples in there, really focusing on pay as you go assistance. So if you remember that's, that's developer getting its own financing and the city only providing, for example, tax increment that comes out of a new district. So that, you know, again, lessens the city's risk. Uh, it talks about um, limiting the duration of assistance as necessary, although it talks about, you know, you can establish tax increment districts for the full duration, but you might limit assistance to a shorter amount. And that's really designed to give you flexibility. Uh, also listed in there is this idea of taking fiscal disparities from inside a tax increment district. You have the choice to choose to take that from inside a district, which keeps any potential impacts other taxpayers uh, uh, neutral, or you could choose to uh, pay for that outside the district, which would give you more increment for a project, but would really result in a tax increase on other commercial properties in the city. So the idea that we'd keep that from within side TIF districts helps mitigate that, that risk as well. Uh, talks about not providing consistence that would provide assistance that would provide a competitive advantage. So you're not going to, you know, do something that would give business A advantage over business B, uh, not using assistance to support land uh, acquisition higher than market value. So if someone comes in and paid twice as much as a property's worth and says, I right, well, now I need assistance for my project, that's part of the analysis to say, no, you, you paid too much for the land. You know, we can't pay for that part of this. And, and that maybe gets taken out of what the need is for the project. Uh, talked about developers paying for all third party costs. So in all of these projects, there are costs incurred with doing the financial analysis and but for test. There are legal costs associated with drafting agreements. So those third party costs would be, and you know, setting up tax increment districts or abatements, those would be borne by the applicants or developers in these cases. Uh, we talked about the fact that you may consider waiving some city fees, but we really talked about that would not apply to SAC and WAC fees. So that's what the policy indicates right now, the draft that's in front of you. Uh, really trying to minimize use of use of city assistance. So that's expressed in there, uh, really pushing on the applicant developer to look at maximizing other outside funding sources before they come to the city and look for city resources. And then really talked about again at the end there, the use of minimum assessment agreements, which are when you do tax increment uh, financing agreements, you can include uh, the notion that they would always retain a minimum assessed value, which will ensure one that, you know, the repayment happens as anticipated uh, and two that there aren't future um, you know court challenges to petition that valuation below what that minimum threshold was set out to be not as important in pay as you go arrangements but certainly if you ever did decide to use general obligation debt attached to a t tax increment district project you'd want to for sure have that so that you know the bonds were able to be repaid uh, then section four, we jump into the qualifications of the project specifically, and that's that's broken out into two sections. The first has to do with what would the minimum qualifications be for uh, providing assistance. And it starts out by, by indicating that the project really should meet more than one of the objectives in section two, which is that, you know, public financing, your objectives for the use of public financing. Uh, thought that was a good, you know, a good change that we talked about here and with staff. Uh, we need again to demonstrate that financial need that's the but for test uh, projects need to be consistent with all of your city plans or you know or they will be by virtue of the planning process that they would go through if they need to go through that process uh, that the developer is going to provide all the information we need to conduct an evaluation and understand what the project is uh, we need a developer to provide guarantees for completion and or repayment and ensuring they've got really the capacity to undertake a project that you would be providing assistance for and then that the, yeah, again, that they have those capabilities, uh, you know, that that they can um, complete those projects, and that the developer uh, must own the project until it's at least operating successfully, right? You don't want we've had instances where you know projects have sold mid construction, and uh, what you want to make sure is that you've got at least through you know completion of the project that that same person that you made a deal with is the one that's going to finish it up. 
Uh, so then we jump into, so some of the desired qualifications. So these are the ones we spend a little more time talking about. These are really the ones personal, I think, to Forest Lake, the ones that you, know, you felt were important to include. Uh, we talked about some of those, you know, uh, starting off here by providing that high ratio of public to private investment. So again, wanting to maximize private sources and other sources as compared to those private uh, public sources. Uh, we, we really talked about wanting to make sure we're increasing the amount of property taxes on a, a redevelopment site, for example, where we're trying to you know, provide assistance for a project that is you know, um, a short-term expense through public financing for a long-term gain, which is you know, longer a bigger tax base for a longer period of time in the city. Uh, again, in here, the, the infrastructure piece comes up, right? We talked about wanting to uh, provide projects that add need to public infrastructure. So it talks about uh, roads, utilities, stormwater, structured parking was listed in there as an infrastructure piece. Uh, something that implements a vision for a city identified redevelopment area. We stopped short of, you know, listing areas, but really kept it broad to say that if you have any existing or future areas, small area plans, redevelopment studies that you do, anything like that, that all fits in here and doesn't make the policy stale. So left that very broad, uh, you know, same thing with, with the next one, we're providing improvement to surrounding land uses, neighborhoods and or the city. Again, a very broad, a very broad statement. Uh, attract or retain an employer within the city. Uh, and then provides uh, increased jobs that are over, I think we said 150% of state minimum wage. I think that might be a typo. Does anyone have the policy up in front of them? Did we say 200 or 150? Different places. I think desired was. One was 200, one was 150. Yeah. So I think 150 is what the policy says. No, I wonder if we did that by intent. Like one was like desired was 200, but are we saying minimum standard was 150? That was one of my questions. Oh, that yeah, that is right. Yes. Yep. Our I, minimum yeah. standard would be 150, but we're saying we would like to see projects that are over 200 percent the state minimum. Yes, that's right. Yep. I had a typo in the presentation in that other section where they were the same, and I had to fix it. So remembering this myself. So yeah, 200. The desire would be this is a desired to obviously achieve wages that are higher than that. Correct. Uh, we talked about uh, promoting housing investment that meets uh, city goals, uh, which, which are listed in there as providing investment in public infrastructure. Again, really that idea that infrastructure would be tied to the housing uh, and then increase housing choice and affordability within the community. There were a bunch of other ones that we talked about as well during our meeting in April, but those are the two that you know, were left in there. Um, uh, providing opportunities for small businesses and entrepreneurs, uh, projects that promote resident economic stability, Again, that blighted, contaminated, or challenged area, you know, very kind of basic stuff there. Preserves or stabilizes a major commercial industrial node. So those are broad and very typical of things that you would see in a policy and gives you a lot of flexibility within what those statements say to do, I think, the kind of projects that you might want to do. Questions about those? I mean, it's kind of the important part of the policy for, is it, is it hitting all of the things that, okay, good, I'm seeing head nods. If not, just go ahead and stop me. So then into, into section five, again, that's that public purpose job and wage requirement section. Uh, we, in there, encompass a lot of the statements that are necessary to have the policy compliant with statute. So, you know, the fact that we're, uh, we must meet a public purpose with a measurable benefit. Uh, job, these are statements that are, you know, kind of statutorily driven, right? Job retention can be a purpose if we document the reasons why for that. Uh, creation of tax base cannot be a sole purpose, right? You can't just simply say, well, it's just to do the tax base. You need to have more public purpose than that. Uh, talks about the fact that creation of jobs is in fact a public purpose. And then here's where we have that wage floor. The, the statute says that you need to specifically identify a wage floor uh, in your policy. And I think we talked about in April, the fact that you would always have the ability to go below that. You just need to do so by holding a public hearing and saying that's what you're going to do. But we settled on this idea that we'd include a floor 150% state minimum wage uh, and, that, and that, that notion that you'd still seek those higher wage opportunities, which is then played out in that desired qualification section. Uh, you, as I said, you can set those job and wage goals at zero after a public hearing. You can set them at whatever you want after a public hearing. You can go below your policy floor. Uh, there are instances where, you know, wh where we use this. Um, one example is like for redevelopment. There is an exception in the statute for redevelopment that allows you to make a calculation about you know, how much money is going in and how much the cost of the developer to do the project. And you might be able to you know, exempt yourself from the business subsidy statute that way. But sometimes you don't quite meet the threshold and you know, it's not necessarily a jobs and wage uh, play. You're really just trying to redevelop a site. 
So you might, in that instance, decide to set your job and wage goals at zero because your goal really is to, you know, eliminate blight and get a site redeveloped that doesn't meet the exception to the statute. So that's one example of what could happen in those instances. Make sense? So again, those are really just statutory requirements. Uh, section six it talks about the fact that you need to have a business subsidy agreement uh, for those projects that are uh, business subsidies. When you do that, uh, you need to indicate the job and wage goals if applicable, right? Unless you've held that public hearing that says you're not gonna do that. Uh, the recipient needs to provide you with the, ne the data necessary to report on that business subsidy. One of the things the law requires is that, you know, once you have a business subsidy, you need to tell uh, D, the, the State Department of Employment and Economic Development, that, hey, we, we granted a business subsidy, and then you'll have to report back to them when that business subsidy agreement has been satisfied and the goals have been met. This is a reporting requirement that you'll have to do annually. It's just, a, you know, you have to do it now. Um, regardless, it's just, it's part of what state statute requires. <clears throat> Uh, that, that agreement has to have recourse if there's a failure to meet the goal. So what that often is, is there's a clawback of the subsidy. If, a, if you said that you were gonna have uh, 20 jobs and you only create 10, then about, you know, generally speaking, what happens is half of the uh, assistance with interest gets clawed back from the developer or business or whatever. There needs to be some recourse there for that. You approve each and every one of those individual agreements uh, as a council and EDA, uh, recommendation by the EDA. The way the process is set up here that we'll talk about, it's kind of a recommendation by the EDA with approval by the council. Uh, so those each individually have to be approved. Um, you know, uh, there are these minimum baseline requirements that are listed in your policy, but again, you can include any other kinds of things in those agreements that you'd like to. Uh, and then the intent again is, you know, that you've got that flexibility to deviate from what that statute requires. Questions about that? All right, so the last section then has to do with that evaluation process. Now, often this will be a, in a lot of policies, it's kind of just a very short kind of, you know, kind of basic section, but we tried to expand this a little bit to memorialize how you want to handle applications for assistance that come into the city. And so, We've done that in, I think, sort of a logical uh, kind of set of steps. And, you know, the first one is, is, I think, fairly obvious. And we talked a lot about this is that somebody that wants to apply for public assistance will come in and fill out an application and submit that application to the staff. And what the policy evaluation section requires is that that applicant needs to submit all of the detailed information necessary to make the evaluation of the project. And so it's not just the financials, it's also uh, listed in there, we've talked about, you know, like site plans, building elevations, enough information that you can make an informed decision about what the project is, what the financing looks like, and does it meet the but for test. You want to be able to kind of see it, you know, in a picture, but you also want to be able to understand it on a financial level so that you can make a, an informed decision about whether you want to provide assistance. So it requires that, and then it requires them to submit any required fees in escrow. So there's an, you know, an application fee for the, the public assistance piece of this, but I imagine there may be other escrows that may need to come into the city, you know, through the planning process or whatever the case may be. So whatever is required, they need to submit that. Then the process uh, talks about take, uh, the city staff along with a third party financial advisor to take that application and make a review of that application. So we talked a little bit about this in April that really involves, uh, generally speaking, like an analysis of the developer's pro forma, right? We're going to go through and look at the you know, um, all of the project costs, the revenues, the operating expenses, the financing, uh, we're gonna boil that down to what is the projected return on investment to the developer. And if it's not enough then it, to, to meet what the market would demand, then that's justification that the project needs assistance. And then the analysis will look to see how much of that assistance do we need to provide in order to get to those market returns on investment. So that's what that process would involve, uh, you know, uh, just before that though, you know, the, the, the staff's gonna look at this and say, you know, does this project meet the goals of the policy, right? Do we have, uh, does it meet the minimum qualifications? Uh, how many of them does it meet? Does it meet any of the desired qualifications? So part of that review looks at that to say, is it meeting what we wanna finance uh, as a city? Uh, that all together, you know, uh, is what the staff will use to decide, does this thing really uh, meet the test of moving forward for the next step, which would be, you know, having the, the EDA look at it and ultimately the council look at it to decide if it's something you want to proceed with and a project that you want to assist. And what we talked about in the policy, and again, this is, you know, draft and conceptual, but we talked about 
and I think we, we touched on this in April as well, but this idea that we would prepare a non-binding term sheet, uh, which would essentially outline the conditions for any proposed financial assistance for the project. Okay, it would lay out the, what is the project? How many units of whatever? How many square feet of whatever is it? What, you know, what, what, what's the construction timeline? What's, what's it gonna be valued at? What kind of assistance are we recommending? How, how long does it take to repay that assistance? All of those details would be in that term sheet. That would come first, uh, we thought, to the EDA uh, to, to be reviewed, and then there would be a recommendation from that meeting to the city council about whether there was you know, agreement to proceed. That term sheet then could be brought to the council and acted upon uh, with all of those you know, various details that you would have to make a good informed decision about whether you want to provide any kind of assistance. And that and and what that also does that approval also does is gives the developer uh, an indication about whether its uh, application for financial assistance is likely to be successful. And we can get to that answer without necessarily having to go through all of the time and expense of creating a TIF district, doing a TIF agreement, for example, doing all those things, only to find out later maybe that maybe that wasn't a project that you know wanted to be supported. So. It saves you and your staff time. It saves the developer time and money, which they greatly appreciate, uh, and gives some feedback. Although that term sheet is not binding, the only generally binding piece of that is the fact that they need to pay the city's expenses in doing the project. But it allows the staff, uh, if that term sheet is approved, to let the developer know that that project can move to the next step, which would be, uh, you know, conduct whatever the project is. If it's a if it's a TIF project, it would mean moving to creation of an actual TIF district. Uh, and drafting of an actual TIF agreement. Both are things are necessary for a TIF deal to be you know, completed with the city uh, and would require them to make an additional escrow deposit to cover the costs of all of those activities. And so what the, uh, the policy talks about right now is making an initial $10,000 escrow deposit. They would need to make more deposits as that's depleted as the time goes on. It's you know very common for like a TIF project, for example, to cost anywhere between twenty and thirty thousand dollars to get done, and that's just district creation, analysis, legal time to prepare an agreement, and you know we're always very upfront about that with the developer to let them know that, and so they have that initial budget estimate, but the escrow will, will be drawn upon, and then when more is necessary, they'll have to submit more, uh, and to cover all those costs. Um, you know, it's possible to, for you to reimburse yourself with future tax increment from a TIF project, for example, but there are a lot of cases where projects have gotten to this point and uh, TIF plans and TIF districts have been created and agreements have been drafted and projects don't move forward and they haven't put their initial deposit up and cities are left, you know, holding the expense uh, associated with that. So this avoids that. And what the policy says then is that uh, the staff won't start the process that I just described unless and if that deposit is received uh, and then that would be the, the, the trigger that starts everything else that needs to happen for that deal to move forward. So that's the process, you know, there, there would need to be then, then there's of course, there's a whole, there's a whole, depending on the type of project, if it's TIF, abatement, a basic loan, anything that the process will sort of differ from there. That's not dealt with here in the policy, but just because there's so many different iterations of what that could look like. But that's really uh, in a nutshell, what that evaluation process is laid out as in the policy. And that is really, uh, the, the whole overview of the policy. Uh, next steps, and Abby talked about this, you know, feedback would be helpful if there is any on this. We would make any changes. We still have obviously an opportunity to do that. Uh, I think we'd wanna have legal counsel review this. We would think about what action is really necessary to bring forward to you next. Uh, I think when uh, Jenny Bolton was here uh, last time, you know, there was, was uncertain, you have all these policies that are out there right now. So we gotta think about well, what do we do with those how do we term this? What's it called? Does it replace all of that? And so there might be some kind of machinations the night that it's approved, but we'll figure all that out and then uh, bring this back for final uh, city council and EDA approval, which as Abby noted, does require a public hearing. So just that 10 day notice, the statute says you have to hold a public hearing anytime you're adopting new criteria. You also have to hold a public hearing anytime you're approving an individual business subsidy. So those are just you know things that you have to keep in mind. Then there is an application that is, it would be attached to this. You already have a, a very good application. We would just make sure that what that's saying is, is, is matching up with the newly adopted policy. That would then become part of what your whole you know, process is to review these, these applications. And you know, you'd have everything in place that you could begin implementation you know, right away after that with any new project that came into the city looking for assistance. So with that, I'm gonna stop, but I'm certainly happy to talk about 
changes, uh, anything we might want to look at with respect to process, or just general questions. I've got Penny, a go ahead. curiosity question. Yeah. The financial advisors, is that an outside source that specializes in looking at TIF applications? It is, yeah, and we do a lot of that work. So it's really referring to, and this at this point, you retain us to do that kind of work, and so we would, Ellers would, would probably be the one that would do that kind of work. But okay, and the legal end, is that Ellers also? Kennedy and Graven, a separate firm. Uh, Kennedy and Graven, Jenny Bolton, right now you're engaged with them to do a lot of your uh, you know, public finance TIF type work. And so you know, they would be, right now, the ones. But again, cities go through RP processes, cities change consulting firms. So we didn't specify the firm in the policy because you, know, you, you just never know what the future might hold with respect to that. Then who keeps track? Is it the city staff or you? That finds, you know, that looks at what's going on, how much is spent, and are they on track, and cards that we look at. Yeah, I mean, it really, it really depends on how the city's individual city chooses to operate. Um, some finance departments will do a lot of that on their own. Some will have us do every, every, every last bit of it. Uh, but and 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 there's any iteration of that in between. Uh, you know, we've worked with Kevin, you know, your finance director for some time. And so, you know, it'd really be up to him and your community development staff, how they want to handle that. But when you do a TIF district, for example, generally what happens is that you, uh, when we do a pay as you go project and it brings TIF in, the project brings TIF in, uh, you are generally providing 90% of what gets brought in as payment to the developer on the pay as you go note. Uh, the statute allows you to keep back 10% to pay for administrative costs. There's dollars there for new projects. So on the front end, you don't have that, right? There isn't a district, there's no TIF. That's why we have the um, applicant or developer or business pay the fee to get everything set up. Once it's set up, once there's increment being generated, there is there are dollars there that you can use to pay for any third party costs that you might have in administering these projects, doing all the details that you're talking about. You can either take that and use it to pay for staff time, as long as it's documented, or you can take it and use it to pay a third party uh, to do that work as well. So there's, it's really just an individual city administrative decision and there's no right or wrong way to do it. Yeah. Other questions, points of feedback? Just open it up. I had, um, so, one of, I have a number of questions, but maybe one of the questions um, is just kind of practical application. Um, when we're looking through the evaluation process, and, and this is something that we run across from time to time, we'll know that there's a project being contemplated and there's some, you know, whether it's some inquiry that's made to the city or some inquiry that's sometimes made to EDA members or council members. Um, just kind of looking for some initial feedback, but it's not yet a formal application. It's not really an application. Um, then there, then something under this process, an actual application is made, and you know staff has some time to work through that application process. The, the, I guess the umbrella question I'm asking is, um, what point does that? When's the first meeting when that application becomes public and is actually publicly discussed? Is it when the term sheet is pre prepared and is it at that point that we've got enough information that there's actually a project here and is that kind of the first public debut of that project? And I, I, I think I maybe have to couch that behind, you know, any, you know, I know there's public data requests, there's all kinds of ways mm -hmm. that data can become public, but there's also kind of like the, pro the process, the way that the process would guide data to become public. Um, so unless there were, I can imagine if there's a planning process that maybe would trigger some public notification of an agenda item. In absence of that, is it the term sheet? Is that really the first EDA's first public view and council's first public view of the subsidy? Yeah, Mayor, members of the council and the EDA, I think uh, in this, the way that this is laid out, I guess the answer probably is yes. Um, there, you know, you all are, obviously free to have your individual conversations with with any anybody that's out there doing anything right um and you know i think that there is also what's at play also is 
as you referenced that kind of you know the data practices law and of course. I, you know, I think, and it's a legal question, and I'm definitely not an attorney, but I think what most attorneys have said is that, you know, you have the ability, if you so choose, to keep those negotiations uh, confidential, if there are negotiations, until such time that a deal is actually made. Uh, at that point, then, those need to be made public. Um, I think if a deal never is made or consummated, then I don't think you necessarily have to share any of that detail. But uh -huh. under the way that this process is laid out, uh, I think, you know, an application that's made could arguably be discovered through a data practices of course, request. Of course. Uh, but, but just as a normal course of, that never happens unless there's a very controversial issue. I mean, no, you know, I mean, people are probably fine just waiting until, you know, the term sheet comes, right? And, and, and that then would be the first time it would probably show up on a public agenda would be that. Uh, and then, of course, uh, there would need to be a, a formal public hearing eventually. Uh, if it's a business subsidy, and that would be noticed uh, as well. Um, you know, there have been even instances where you can even keep the entity confidential until even through some of that, you know, information. Uh, be, you know, sometimes you get these, um, you know, kind of site search firms looking for uh, a site for a business, but they're looking at multiple locations, and so they may come to you with some kind of a code name or something. So there's ways to, but it, it gets back to probably ultimately the, data practices law, and then how you choose to administer the, the policy. And the goal isn't to, you know, to not present information, but it's also to put everyone in a good situation where right. we're having a public discussion when there's enough information to have a public discussion. Right. And also, especially if we're talking about public subsidy, that's an evaluation process on the part of the developer that that first inquiry may not be their final ask. And so let's, I just want to give time for that to mature before we're providing a lot of public feedback and um, potentially noise on a project that just isn't ready for prime time yet, so. Yeah, and Mayor, I will say that, um, especially when there might, if you're a community vying for a significant manufacturing investment or something like that, yeah. I'll just say, yeah. the, the folks that are conducting those searches value that um, confidentiality, and in fact, sometimes require signing of non-disclosure agreements, which you can't sign away your you know, your, your, um, uh, anything other than what the data practices request says. But, but, but the point is, is that, yes, they desire that, you know, they may be evaluating multiple locations, and that can be an asset to you as a city if you can, to the extent allowed by law, maintain that confidentiality for a period of time. And that term sheet is fairly, I mean, it's my read of it is that is fairly early in the process, right? That is the first a round of information has been exchanged, staff has had an opportunity to do initial analysis and to present some information um right of this is if it uh least. mayor if it gets to that point i guess what i would say is that that would be pretty much a fully negotiated deal right i mean that would be uh you know the developer saying i can move this deal forward under these parameters and it would be this it would be the city saying we believe that these parameters also meet the intent of our policy. So it, it, it does require, uh, you know, it getting to a point of being a deal that could be actually done. So there might be, a, might be a little further along than what you're saying. But again, that can also happen fairly quickly after an application is made. It doesn't need to take months and months and months. There's, there's times where an application might be made and two months later we're at, you know, the various bodies with the term sheet. So I guess it just depends on the kind of project and, you know, the perspective, your perspective of what early means in the process. Open to council and EDA staff feedback on this, but I, I feels like if I'm just looking back at some of the past projects that we've done. Usually there is prior to getting to that term sheet, there is some need or desire to have an understanding of what is council's appetite or EDA's appetite. And so is there something we could do upstream that maybe it should be memorialized in process that then at, you know at that point the developer knows that it is going to be public information but allows for some level of appetite review prior to getting to term sheet i i don't know if it's i think if i could add one point of clarity in terms of this process one what we've been doing historically here if somebody comes and asks for tiff it's sort of like staff is starting to vet those out a little bit based on I would say early information, which can obviously change as financing, as costs come into, you know, that picture gets clearer. Um, but a lot of developers will want some assurance that, am I going to get a subsidy? Am I going to, does this project qualify for TIF? 
that is sort of the intent to bring it to the EDA saying, based on the initial review, the initial look at it, yes, that initial term sheet would be, you know, if you can meet within these parameters, we can see a TIF deal being, you meet in the criteria from EDA's perspective, but still retains that ability for that, because stuff can negotiate out, costs can change, something can come out before the final. So the developer knows, yes, they, they, this project, you know, would qualify or meets the initial criteria, go out and, you know, do that, make that initial investment or those additional investments. And then when you come back to council, you have a pretty good understanding that yes, this will probably be approved because they always want like an assurance on day one that this is gonna TIF qualify, which we don't wanna give because obviously the numbers can change, projects can change. And this is sort of a way to say, you're going through somewhat of a light approval process at that term sheet stage saying, <coughs> if you're close to this, understanding that there's gonna be a little bit of wiggle room, a little bit of renegotiation before final, then you can go out and do that. So I think that's what's trying to happen here with this sort of two-step approval process where it's, you know, as Jason said, it's not a binding term sheet at the beginning, but there's something there. And then when the application comes in, all the requirements of the application are documents that we need from a staff perspective to process that. So again, we're not asking for anything that's we would need later on. We're trying to get that all on the front end and then can work the project through, um, but it gives the developer a little bit of assurance earlier on than I think historically we've been able to give them and in a more formal formal process. And oh, you would say that you would say that the term sheet is the right place for it to be on a first EDA agenda. Is that yeah, I mean, I, I think because you're going to see some come through, and I mean. And some developers who have done public assistance are a little bit more astute, they're a little bit more seasoned than that, so they kind of know what to expect. But some come in, they really don't understand what it all looks like, and they just sort of want to, the term sheet at least kind of walks them through to get them to that first step. But I think that is probably the first step where it kind of does sort of go out into the community saying that this is a project that, you know, meets the criteria of the subsidy of the policy that we have in place. I could also add, at the time of the submittal of the application, we do request a concept plan. So it's not like the development team has invested a lot in engineering and whatnot. That would be the time that you, you would see our planning commission or council. That's the kind of baseline project information that we'd be asking for anyways. So it really does kind of come at the start of the development process in the city, if that makes sense. And Mayor, if I could add too, I just, that, that this is only for the public financing I part of the, yeah. And, and so there would probably be, and there often is in many communities, a, a step that might precede any of that, which might be like a concept plan review from a, from a planning standpoint. So that would be the first time you're exposed maybe to the project. So it just depends on how you handle those things, but they can be often separated. Okay. What are, I'm interested in other thoughts. Is that ring to be the right cadence and the right process? Is everyone comfortable with that? It helps to talk that through. I mean, for me, I'm a visual person though, but to have this like a little flow or process flow of how this works just as a frame of reference for everyone. You know, I mean, this is this is for this part of it, but just what you're talking about, Mayor, to like, okay, someone approaches us. What is step one? You know, okay, we, we do this, we talk amongst ourselves or when do we bring it to each other? And then, you know, Okay, now it's time for the application process. And when do we, who do we approach? When do we get it on the agenda then? What is the flow and what is that process? But that's, that's what I'm used to is what is our, what are the steps? I know there's been some projects where there's uh, been a desire for dual track. I mean, does this create that? The question. This does, that we can run them concurrently with the planning zoning entitlement processes, yes. When you say dual track, do you mean planning processes kicking off? Time, yeah. And just for reference, we I, in my time here, I have been kind of working on the ideal uh, kind of development review, thinking about how financial assistance requests factor into the development review process. We're still just a little choppy um, because we are gonna be going through some code amendments in this next year that's gonna change that development review process, not crazily, but remove some redundancies, create some, reduce some of the, you know, hurdles that we've kind of maybe created in the development community. And so I haven't invested a lot of time, but I think we could probably put together a pretty easy little flow chart that can get us, at least for the interim, until we kind of go through those code amendments. I think that's just also helpful. I, I like your idea of having something visual so we can just know where projects are in the stage. It's helpful if nothing else, just we get peppered by questions, 
I'm members of the development community are reaching out directly and just to know where something is at and um, I think it will be important. Other, let's just open it up, other broader questions? Yeah, just, uh, one thing, I, mean, I think this does a really nice job of capturing what our conversation from a couple months ago around redevelopment, job creation, job retention, housing. Um, I just, there's one point that I just don't think makes sense, it doesn't belong in this policy, and that's item two, two nine, uh, diversifying, or further diversity, equity, inclusion goals. Given the fact, to my knowledge, we don't have any goals, I think this is I, bad policy to I, include that in there. I flagged that same, I flagged that same, um, like, how do we quantify that? Like, do we have equity, diversity, diversity, inclusion? Does that need to be quantified, or is there a way we could phase, phrase that, that? Well, what's the whole point of it? I mean, this is about financing around job creation and getting rid of blighted property. And that's a, your, um, I mean, some, many policies would say we want to encourage equity and diversity. Um, and you might make the argument that that doesn't belong, and that's a fair argument. Um, so I, I question is, do you remove it altogether? Do we, I think as stated, it implies like there's a, a number goal that we just haven't, we don't have. Um, yeah, Mayor, I members of the council, I think if I'm remembering the conversation correctly, I mean, we had a, a the other, you know, kind of options with more specificity there and I thought I think the idea was just to um, not well at the time and you you have complete discretion about whether you want to even include that or not obviously right um, uh, I think at the time that the idea was just to bring it back to a very broad statement that if there ever kind of it's kind of like if there ever were to be those things that you know it's there in the policy uh, but but it doesn't you know uh, specify any specific goals right because your point there weren't maybe any in place so Again, totally your call uh, to keep it in or out. Um, and this would be the time before the public hearing and final adoption to do that. The time, I, I remember I was asking if we had any, have any, like just as a, as a statement goals vision around our diversity, equity and inclusion as a city, um, which I think at the time we discussed we don't. And so it was just, right, should we? Should we? Um, I know where I work, we have goals around equity inclusion and inclusion. Um, and I, I think as it applies to this is do we want a certain number of our <coughs> diverse and maybe that's why because I think some of the examples that you brought had that in it mm -hmm. and I think that's yeah. where you know we, we right. lifted it from perhaps some of those so I maybe that's where it comes <coughs> from that you know and to have all you know, or do we want to make sure we have diversity in our community in terms of the requirements that are there? That type of thing, and I'm sure that's so I'm just bringing that different point of view. That's something that's important to us. I think, it's a, <clears throat> I think it's a can of worms. I think the project should be looked at for its merit of the project itself and not who's behind it, because now we're gonna have to quantify how much Who's going to get what? There's going to be two more packets of this thick just to, <clears throat> excuse me, just to figure that out. I'm not against it, but I think it should be on the merits of the, the, the project itself and not the company, the person that's behind it. That's just my thought. Yeah, I'm not saying one way or the other. I'm just saying I'm sure that's the intention behind that. Right. But I would say, I mean, I think as maybe a city, we want to have some. You do hear quite often that we're a pretty non-diverse community. So I think it might be something we want to take a look at in terms of what, what do we not want to be. We'll do say that. So just. Anders, I hear what you're saying. and. Understand, uh, understand what you're saying and would say, you know, certainly a growing diverse, becoming more diverse community. I, I, I think Chris makes a good comment though in that the evaluation of the, do you want that to be part of the evaluation process and would you use it if you had two projects side by side? No, I don't do we want that, that to become, no, and I'm not yeah, suggesting yeah. you do, but, but for that reason, um, 
evaluating each project on its merits based on, and a lot of this is financial data that is, you know, does something qualify for public assistance and um, to have that be kind of the calculation, um, I think is appropriate. And I, th I think, you know, when I was comfortable with it being put in the initial policy, it was more around it is important and acknowledging that that topic is important. But because it's important, does that mean that it needs to be stated in every single policy that we have as we are, you know, we're considering all sorts of zoning and ordinance things. And I'm not sure that that thread needs to be specifically stated in every single, we can have some umbrella city um, statements of importance without it being a consideration specifically on every policy, which to your point then starts to imply that you need to have a way of measuring it and a way of evaluating and sure we're at that point yet. Or even just a goal to start, because this is referencing goals, but we don't really have them. So I can understand kind of, it's a great dialogue. I think it seems that maybe a little premature. And then as we as an organization start to look at DEI goals and policies, we'll have to look at how they relate to all of our other policies in the future. I agree with Chris. I mean, this whole thing is that it has to be based on the project Formula. It doesn't matter who's doing it. It does not matter whatsoever. And so I would, it could be, it could get to be a. Taking back to that point to some of our anti discrimination statements that we have throughout the city as kind of an overall governing of how we how we govern ourselves as a city and that language exists all, elsewhere and because it exists elsewhere does it need to be specifically called out in this policy and it sounds like it's a little premature from where we are today. Related to that number seven has got some language in there too. Can you just remind me what that one is called? Number nine you said and then number seven has got diversity and diversity. Well, you were talking about housing quality. related. Diversity of okay, jobs. Or jo yeah. yeah. I think one thing to keep in mind too with this is that it says accomplish one or more of the following objectives. So with this list of 11, that doesn't mean we have to sit there and hit every single one. The goal is to hit one ideally more. Um, so for me, it, I, I don't see the hurt of it being in there. I do think it's broad and there's a lot of gray area that we need to dive into a little bit more, but just to keep in mind, it's one or more. Other points of feedback or areas of concern, question? Go ahead. On the, on the, um, the wage uh, floor or ceiling, yeah. I guess it would be floor, 150%, so minimum wage is, I don't know, $11, so 20, I mean, that's gonna, right out of the gate, any retail or restaurant would probably not qualify for that. So is do you see that most cities have that language in, in these agreements? Yep, uh, you, have, I mean, you have to have some floor, the law says you have to have some kind of floor. Um, there, we, uh, there, so there are a couple of things related to that. One is that, um, you know, when you do a project you, and you have an agreement to provide jobs, you don't have to have every job meet that, that test. You might have a, a, a facility that has 20 jobs at it, but you're saying that, you know, we're going to require that you create three jobs that meet the goal. Okay, so, so you might have a, you know, the managers or whatever there that they, they can meet the goal. It wouldn't preclude folks that are below that wage to, to also meet the goal. So that all gets back to what goes in your business subsidy agreement. Uh, if for some reason that floor became problematic because of what you're talking about, then you also have the ability to simply waive that wage floor and create a different wage floor or whatever it is you'd want to do uh, through the public hearing process. But I think the way most folks handle that is that, yeah, you're not apply this isn't going to apply to every job. And then the places where it does, uh, typically you're talking about those manufacturing type jobs and you're kind of sometimes maybe mirroring what other um, like like the state might be requiring, for example, right? You might be mirroring some of those requirements and they have, you know, some of those same kind of requirements uh, as well. So, yeah, I mean, it's a floor, you have to have one. That's what it, you know, that's what's here. You can change it. Um, it just had to, you have to say something uh, and indexing it to something rather than having a number sometimes is better just, you know, cause it doesn't get stale as time moves on. And just for reference, um, the minimum would be at a current rate, 12 and a half to $16 an hour um, for Minnesota's 
state minimum at, at the 150 percent so still well you're right that the there are some industries that don't end up paying that um, the use of public funds for job creation purposes we should really be looking at trying to utilize those dollars for higher more living wage positions that's the yeah, that's kind of the, the heart of what the challenge is, is this is intended to be a broad policy that might be used for a manufacturer or it might be used for, you know, a, a project that is more blight focused where, you know, you reference like moving the floor altogether. Is it commonly understood that that is a kind of a project by project negotiable item? Because what I don't want to do is I want to set it at a level that when it makes sense to lean on if the project is being done for job creation, then by all means, we should be looking towards higher end jobs. Um, but if the project's being done for other purposes, then we're probably in scenarios where we would agree for that to be lower. Um, that flexibility is that commonly known. Um, yeah, Mayor, it is. Yes. I mean, the, the statute, you know, asks you to apply a wage floor to, you know, one wage floor to your whole policy, which of course, you know, might apply to different industries. And so, yeah, it's understood that. And that's why that flexibility is there. You know, yeah, there are a lot of exceptions, you know, to the statute that won't even require you to deal with this. Frankly, most of the places uh, where we work, a lot of the projects aren't even a business subsidy because a lot of what we've done is housing or redevelopment that is excluded from the statute, right? It's probably only if you put a business on a greenfield site and give it money that this is going to apply in all likelihood. And so uh, there are broad based um, applications and that is, is understood. I've got a, <clears throat> a question. I think you said that if we set the floor through a public hearing, we could lower it for a particular project. Is that what you said? Correct, yeah. And the statute actually lets you do that it, it rec to recognize the variability that's out there. So, so how about the other way? Let's so say you set it at zero. Six months from now, what does it take to bring it back to 150%? Well, once you make the deal, well, you, you would only be for that project. When, when you do that and take that action, it's only for the subsidy for that one project. Your broader policy does not change. That stays the same and does not change. It's only the agreement that you make with that particular business that would set it that, that threshold for only that deal. Yeah. Well, and we're targeting a 200%. Well, so we're targeting job creation of 200%. So we're not going after the minimum anyway. Uh, I have a question for Chris, the county. Anything that you see out of this that's any different from the cities that you've worked with? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. Could you repeat it? Any of this that you see here, is this kind of go in line with other cities that you, the county's working with, that you, projects you see come through different EDAs? Um, Madam Mayor, Council Members, EDA members, that's a really good question. <clears throat> so in Washington County, there may be only one city of the 33 that offers um, business assistance in a greenfield. The county does not have a business subsidy policy, so the county does not offer incentives for businesses, with the exception that they have done some tax abatement projects, which does not require a, uh, a but-for test and does not require a um, business subsidy agreement if it's used for infrastructure. And so the county historically has used their tax abatement dollars for like bridges or water and sewer projects that will further develop an area so that a business can benefit from it, but other businesses can as well. Um, but in Washington County, historically speaking, the only cities right now that I can think of that might offer a business incentive for a greenfield would be Cottage Grove, uh, with the exception that some cities are offering um, redevelopment TIF for redevelopment projects, which is still a, um, you know, you, I, I see that you've got a, a but four test year for, for TIF, which would, you know, it certainly apply to a, a redevelopment project as well, but very few cities um, in the metro area would offer business subsidies for a greenfield development because there are no surprises. You know going into it what you're going to be paying for, which is different than redevelopment. Redevelopment is always going to be more expensive to take down a building that has value, throw it in a dumpster, and then you can start over. And there's a lot of unknowns with redevelopment. So what I'm seeing more often than not is uh, tax abatement, uh, tax income and financing, and sometimes business subsidies are more, more commonly used for redevelopment projects within the county. I hope that answered your question. Uh, a little bit, so, but out of this in general, not just the greenfield, is this something that's in line that you see with other cities, that other cities are doing other than the greenfield piece? Uh, 
other questions? Other points of feedback? Um, just maybe just a point of clarification um, that I had noted or just maybe to make sure I'm mm -hmm. understanding correctly. Um, item seven, three, like three seven, public financing talks about not creating a, a competitive advantage and they must, um, the applicant must demonstrate that a competitive advantage um, from similar projects is not created. And I'm assuming that that is kind of proven out through the but for test. Is that where that, because I would think by its nature, two projects side by side, one has public assistance, the other doesn't, there is a competitive advantage, but it's, is it the but for test that we lean on to kind of hit the fairness threshold? Mayor, yeah, generally speaking, yes. I mean, I, I think that what, you know, um, I think it, you know, it's, uh, I think it's idea that you're not gonna, you know, finance a quick trip and not a holiday under the same set of circumstances, right? I mean, that's okay. kind of the idea, but you might finance a quick trip if it's on a contaminated site and that needs redevelopment, and then you might only give assistance to mitigate those circumstances that bring it down to greenfield conditions, for example. That's kind of the idea there. Yeah. All right, I just have one last thing. Um, on page six items, it's D items three and six are just are the same. Same, yeah, yeah. that's actually fixed in this draft that I have up right now. There's another instance of that too somewhere in here that I also fixed. Thank you. All right. Now, timing for next steps. Do we have some thoughts on? Certainly, there's. Um, I think from this, we'll take just the preliminary feedback we've received. Um, we'll also do a legal review with it. Probably um, see if Chris has any additional comments. Say within the next couple of months, we'd hope to bring this back to the EDA for that recommendation. But again. Do you want to cross reference with any of the policies we've already adopted our new application form just to make sure it's consistent package and make sure that if we need to rescind any old policies, we kind of get it all together for you. So we'll keep you posted as we work, but we'd hope to have this within the next couple of months at the latest uh, the end of summer adopted and finalized. So Any other points of feedback items to consider. All right. That being the end of our planned agenda, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. I'll oh, second. Motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And